Good morning. I am Ruben Spenha Cisne, Dean of our Graduate School of Economics, EPGE, of this Getulio Vargas Foundation. I'll hand the word to Professor Vinicius Carrasco, uh, who is going to communicate some problems we had this morning. And afterwards, to Professor Carlos, who is the teaching director of our school. Please. Thank you, Rubens. So first of all, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Rubens uh, and EPGE for hosting such a wonderful workshop. Uh, we really appreciate. Umberto cannot be here now, uh, so he's handling some uh, issues we had with David Martimor. He's fine, David Martimor is fine, but won't be able to come, and Umberto is uh, you know, taking through uh, hospitals and exams and stuff, but nothing serious. Thanks again for coming, uh, and thanks Rubens and EPGE for such a, a wonderful uh, Event. Well, just just uh, in name of the whole school, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I hope uh, we all have a, a great meeting. We have all the nice people to have here, so let's let's do a good job. There. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, I think that I'd like to start acknowledging the fact that. The speakers today have come from so far away to honor us, and we are extremely delighted to have your attention to share these moments with you. In the last four years, we could have moments as these which you are having today, uh, when we had some workshops somehow related to this one. Last, I'd like, besides thank you all, I'd like to thank uh, Vinicius Carrasco for helping Umberto uh, with this, uh, putting all these uh, sessions together. To thank Carlos uh, Eugenio, who has helped them as well. To thank you all for being here. And last but not least, les sponsors et les, les, les nerfs de la guerre. Né? So I'd like to thank our uh, professional master, which is directed by Professor Ricardo Cavalcante and Professor Juiz Dutra, for financing this uh, seminar. Uh, and I want to remind you all that uh, we are being streamed to several different uh, locations uh, online to Brazil. And this is uh, something that usually has to accomplish distinctiveness, which is sharing. So I wish you all a good day. I wish that you have a good stay in Rio, and I wish you all a good seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Hubings. So I guess we should get started. Uh, we're having the first session, uh, Yuli Sanikov, speaking about dynamic trading Price inertia, front running, and relationship banking. Yuli, please. Leandro will discuss the paper. It's working. Okay, great. Um, okay. so um, I want to say first that it's a pleasure to be here, um, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a, uh, um, it's it's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, so let me start with the presentation. So this is a, a joint paper with uh, Andrzej Skripac, who is uh, at uh, Stanford, GSB. Um, and uh, this paper, broadly, it's related to market efficiency or market inefficiency. So uh, uh, efficient markets is uh, when the prices reflect uh, uh, all the information that's available about fundamentals. Uh, but in practice, are market efficient? Efficient? Well, people don't believe so. They try to make money off of markets, uh, uh, and uh, broadly, this is related to what kinds of uh, frictions there are. Uh, how is it that uh, people make money? Uh, what kinds of uh, implications could it potentially have for uh, the real economy that uh, 
prices don't necessarily reflect the fundamentals, okay? Uh, so this is broadly, but uh, uh, more narrowly, we started thinking about uh, some specific uh, inefficiencies. So uh, uh, price impact um, trades in markets like equity markets or uh, uh, swap markets, uh, interest rate derivatives or currency derivatives, they have price impact. Um, trading large quantities, somehow people cannot uh, trade immediately, but if, uh, they want, if institutions want to trade, then their trading algorithms, they try to spread the trades over time to execute, uh, to optimize the uh, execution price. Um, people talk about uh, price momentum in markets, so price momentum uh, seems to be inconsistent with uh, market efficiency because you know this is predictable movement of the price in in one direction uh, people talk about front running in markets so front running is when uh, there is a, a large seller for example and uh, 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 certain traders try to identify the large seller and try to sell ahead and people think that this could be very inefficient um, uh, caring about the source of uh, flow. So um, it turns out that in practice, um, people care about who they're trading against, okay? So if uh, the current price of Microsoft is uh, um, $48 a share, and I want to buy some shares of Microsoft, uh, why should I care if uh, the seller of the shares is uh, Leandro or uh, Vanguard. So Vanguard is a, a large uh, um, fund uh, in the US. Uh, and somehow people care about the source of flow. So for example, Citadel Securities is a market maker that uh, uh, pays retail brokerage Ameritrade for, for the flow. So they know that uh, the flow from Ameritrade comes from uh, uh, retail investors and somehow knowing that this is the flow that comes from retail investors, that knowledge allows them to uh, make uh, a lot of money executing these trades. Um, there has been a lot of talk about uh, high frequency trading. So we think that in general, um, for an economist, it's hard to think about these issues and we wanted to build a theoretical framework for thinking about these issues. So that's the motivation. Uh, for this paper. Uh, for the sake of time, just a brief mention of some related literature. So there are uh, papers with noise traders on market microstructure, like the Kyle model. Uh, and in those papers, uh, there is an insider who has private information. Uh, but uh, the, the prices, they do not fully uh, reflect the information of the insider. The insider slowly reveals the information through prices. Um, and uh, uh, in that environment in equilibrium, it's possible to talk about price impact of trades uh, to certain degree, uh, but not things like uh, uh, price momentum because given the information of uh, uh, the, the market the public has, the prices are uh, martingales. And also, with noise traders, it's impossible to talk about welfare in the market uh, because uh, noise traders, they are not uh, rational traders who have a utility function. Uh, there are models of trade in which everybody is rational. So there are symmetric models like uh, Vajanus. Um, uh, and uh, um, here it's possible to talk about price impact and welfare. Uh, but a lot of the interesting things we find come from heterogeneity in the market. So we want to uh, build a model of heterogeneous market participants. Uh, in the model of Vajanos, there is uh, no price momentum, uh, no front running, and uh, the flow is homogeneous because everybody is symmetric. Okay. Uh, people recently have been talking about uh, high frequency trading. Uh, so there is a book by Michael Lewis called Flash Boys. So anybody has read the book, Flash Boys? So some of you. So you know, in the US, this 
This uh, was, uh, has made a lot of, uh, uh, has generated a lot of discussion. Um, okay, so let me talk about the model. So um, this is going to be a linear quadratic model of trade. So linear quadratic because we want to uh, keep it as simple as possible and uh, to be able to uh, go further uh, in terms of the analysis and the results, so we want to keep the model simple. So there are N traders, um, and uh, they can trade a risky asset. So the risky asset is a source of risk, for example, that they're exposed to, and then there's cash. So preferences over holdings of risky asset, uh, we make them very, very simple. Uh, and this is an approximation for what would happen, uh, you know, if, uh, so people are risk averse, this is, this is uh, just a reflection of uh, uh, that people do not like exposure to risk. So you can think about the position in the risky asset as exposure to some type of a risk. So for example, it could be exposure to uh, currency risk. Uh, so uh, uh, it could be a firm trading in this market um, and uh, it's getting its uh, revenues, uh, in, for example, in U.S. dollars, and it pays its cost in Brazilian real. Uh, so uh, this risk exposure, it has private information how much risk it, it's exposed to, and then it wants to hedge its exposure in the market, for example, the market for uh, currency swaps. Okay. So uh, ideally it wants to have no risk at all, but the more risk it has, either positive or negative risk exposure, it doesn't like it, it starts experiencing this utility because of risk aversion. So these preferences are summarized by this quadratic function. Uh, coefficient B uh, is how risk averse the firm is. Okay, so uh, coefficient B is going to be important. Uh, there will be players, traders, who are small, and those have large coefficient B and uh, uh, they want to trade faster to basically get rid of the risk exposure. They're less patient in that sense. And then there will be traders who have a, a small B, and those are large traders who can uh, wait and who can strategize to try to execute at a better price. Okay. Uh, so traders, they have private information, private shocks to their holdings of X, so brokers could get orders from clients uh, to optimally execute in markets. This doesn't have to be a market for interest, but could be market for equity, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. So given these preferences, uh, if we take the um, allocation of every single market participant, what's the efficient way to reshuffle it, to allocate it efficiently, is this is the first order condition. Okay. Uh, so uh, the allocation Efficient allocation is proportional to risk capacities. This is the benchmark. This is what would happen uh, if the markets were efficient. Uh, and uh, we can figure out what is going to be the price uh, of risk the, related to the risk premium. Uh, the price is, uh, depends on the total market risk capacity. The uh, bigger the total market risk capacity, the less sensitive is the price to the total allocation, and it depends on the total allocation. Uh, so that's the um, formula for the first best price. Okay, so these Bs, they will be in the model uh, different, uh, and it turns out that the difference is going to be a key to getting price momentum front running, wanting to know for their source of flow, those types of uh, things that happen in the market, we want to have a theoretical understanding for these phenomena. Okay, uh, so how the allocations change over time? The allocations are going to change over time because people trade, okay? So this is going to be trading among the players, the flow of trades, and then the allocations are going to change because of the private shocks. So how to interpret these shocks, so these are Brownian shocks, is that at a given moment of time, a player may learn that he is uh, exposed to more of this risk, and now uh, he wants to trade 
uh, to hedge it. Okay. So what I have done so far is I have defined um, preferences. Uh, I have defined uh, how uh, the allocations uh, are, how the risk exposures, how the players receive them, and how they can be traded. Okay, uh, people can pay each other to uh, uh, trade units of X, uh, but they have not yet defined the mechanism. So I'm going to define the, the trading mechanism and think about the trading mechanism in a couple of slides. But for now, where do these preferences come from? So, you know, you can say that, well, in practice, people do not have these quadratic preferences. What is this? So this is uh, just a, a simplification um, and uh, uh, a more uh, micro-founded model could be a model where uh, people uh, get, for example, risky dividends uh, from an asset. Uh, and uh, uh, the dividends, they, they change over time. And people, they do not have private information about the dividends. There's no private information about fundamentals. Uh, but uh, there is private information about uh, the amount of uh, uh, asset that uh, the player has. Okay. Uh, so this is this equation uh, we have seen. And the shocks here, so uh, it could be that this is a market for um, uh, money managers that uh, invest in a market portfolio. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the shocks to the uh, money managers, uh, uh, so, so this could be interpreted as um, the discrepancy between the portfolio that the money manager is actually holding um, and uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, market that the clients want to hold. So each time the clients move money between, uh, uh, let's say, the money market account and uh, uh, the stock market, then the money manager has to reflect these trades by actually trading in the market. Okay. So, um, and then... Uh, these money managers, they face, they face the problem of how to optimally execute these trades in order to reflect the client transactions. Okay. So this is a model in which the uh, money managers, they have exponential preferences, so they, can, they consume out of their uh, cash holdings. Uh, they want to minimize their uh, risk exposure, and this model ends up uh, reducing to a... a to a linear quadratic model. So if you work through the, through the algebra, uh, it actually uh, uh, reduces uh, to it. Okay. So um, now I have defined preferences. Okay. These are the quadratic preferences. Um, and I have defined how the allocations change. Now, how can the players determine, how can the market determine uh, the trading flows between the players? And uh, um, and at what price and what are the rules? Okay. So what do we have to determine? We have to determine, um, given the holdings of all players, um, how the market price for X is going to form, and uh, how the uh, transfers uh, of uh, this asset X how they're going to be generated. Okay, so uh, let's think about the uh, trading rules. Uh, and here, before forming a trading mechanism, I'm going to think about, uh, about it in intuitive terms uh, along the lines how people think in actual markets. Okay, so in this market, large and small traders, they're going to have different incentives. Why? Because the small traders, they're impatient to trade. If, they're, if they have a, a currency risk exposure, they cannot absorb it. They have to trade as fast as they can. So these are the small traders. But the large traders, they can absorb the risk uh, at lower cost through their balance sheets. So they are more willing to wait and uh, to spread the trades over time in order to optimize the execution price and minimize uh, price impact. Okay, so this means that if you trade in this market, 
you have to care about who's your counterparty. Because if you uh, buy from a, a small trader, you know that the small trader executes all, everything almost right away. But if you buy from a large trader, then you know that after you buy, the large trader spreads trades over time, you know, maybe over the day, maybe even longer, to try to optimize the execution price. So they're going to keep on selling during the day, which means that the, they're going to keep pushing the price down. And so you, then uh, you wish you had waited to buy later. So, so you're going to want to know, um, if you look at the market at any moment of time, you want to know not just the price, uh, but you also want to know uh, how the market looks like outside the price. Okay, so outside the price, uh, who are the buyers at the given moment of time? What is their size? Who are the sellers at the given moment of time? What is their size? You want to know that information, yes. So you, you want to know that information, exactly. You want to know that information, but whether you observe it in this model or not, that's, that's, uh, um, that's the next slide. Okay. So now, the, just to summarize it very clearly, people, when they trade, they want to know what kind of an iceberg it is. Okay? They, they see this, but they want to know how much, is, is, how much more is there. Is it an iceberg that looks like this, or is it an iceberg that looks like this? So this is an inflatable one. There is obviously very little underneath the water because this is all just air. So uh, and now uh, we can think about different mechanisms. Okay, we can think about a market, which is um, we can think about should we let players know who they are trading against? Okay, so no, we can we can think about an anonymous market. Okay. Uh, so this is the market in which people trade, and they try to uh, the information about the who who are the buyers and who are the sellers is extremely relevant. But uh, but in this market, they do not know this information. They're going to try to learn it over time from price behavior by by talking to other people. You know, they're going to try to learn this uh, relevant information. So generally, this is complex due to filtering. Okay. So in this paper, we focus mostly on this case. Yes, uh, this is a tractable case. So we're going to allow players actually know the source of the flow. And uh, we decided that because this is a more tractable setting, we want to understand this market first. Okay. When the, when the, uh, so in practice, it's not that unrealistic because uh, some market makers they pay for retail flow, so they have some information about the source of flow. A lot of information about the uh, source of flow is out there. Uh, NICE New York Stock Exchange has a uh, recent program that uh, tries to help retail investors and allows retail investors to mark their orders as such. Brokers, uh, you know, there are large trades. They, they call each other to try to get the information. Okay. So in practice, it's a hybrid between these, these two. Uh, but here we are going to study uh, this one first. Uh, if there is time, I may be able to talk about the other one. How much time do I have, by the way? I think I have uh, 20 more, 25. 25 more minutes. Okay. All right. 24. 24. Okay. One minute. One minute is gone. So uh, I think I, I'm going to focus on this one. Uh, if there is time, I'll comment on, on the other one as well. So. Suppose that players know the identi uh, players know uh, how much each other market participant is, is selling, and based on that, then they want to uh, decide how much they themselves want to participate in the market. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay, uh, let me do this backwards. Okay. So what does it mean that they know the source of flow? It means that if uh, there is an auction, so in markets in practice, it's basically an auction. Why? Because when people submit limit to market orders, they could sub submit many different uh, limit to market orders. Effectively, they submit supply and demand functions. 
uh, in the markets in practice. Okay. Uh, but uh, if uh, players know the, uh, who is on the other side, um, then effectively they can condition their supply or demand on the identity of the counterparty. Okay, so effectively their uh, supply or demand functions, uh, this is the intercept. Uh, so uh, what, what does this function say? This function says that uh, um, I'm willing to buy the, the different quantities from uh, the different uh, other people, player I, uh, at this price. And the more I want to buy, the, uh, the lower has to be the price to convince me to buy it. Uh, and I might put different weights to, the, uh, to different players because they care about whether they're large or small. Okay. So uh, this, this game is a conditional double uniform price auction conditional because people can uh, submit supply demand functions conditioning an identity of a, a counterparty. Um, and uh, this is one way to think about it. Uh, and because, because this is a linear quadratic game, uh, ultimately what this is going to boil down to, and we have a theorem that those two things are equivalent, is uh, there is an equivalent direct revelation mechanism uh, in which each player is going to announce his allocation to the mechanism, and then the mechanism is going to take the vector of allocations, and the mechanism is going to determine the price at which, uh, e, at which trade is going to take place at a given moment of time, at which all units are going to be traded at a given moment of time, and uh, the flows of all players. Okay, so here, as a function of the player's announcements, Q is going to be a matrix. The mechanism is going to determine uh, the, how much each player is uh, buying or selling. Uh, so Q is a, is a square matrix, so multiplied by a vector, we get a, 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 vector, of, uh, a vector of flows. Uh, and of course, uh, markets have to clear, so, uh, so, for, uh, so the Qs, individual Qs have to add up to, to zero. Okay. Uh, so um, given the allocation X, the vector of allocations x, q is going to determine how those allocations are going to be transferred uh, among the players and at what price, at price p, okay? Uh, and then the players will get new shocks and their allocations will change because of the new shocks and then they're gonna trade some more and so on and so forth. So this is the, this is the market dynamics. And uh, well, how to think about this mechanism is by making an announcement to the mechanism which uh, enters uh, here, the player is going to affect, he's going to be able to control how much he's buying or selling, okay? So uh, if I want to sell more, I just tell the mechanism that I actually have more to sell and then the mechanism determines the rate. So, uh, and uh, if, if I want to sell more, then of course uh, the price is going to drop. So uh, we are going to solve for the the an incentive compatible mechanism, okay, uh, in which uh, uh, players they uh, tell the truth to the mechanism, and then we are going to figure out well how the players actually trade and what kinds of phenomena we can observe uh, in the markets when they trade. All right, so maybe. Uh, a few minutes for some algebra. So there, we have a theorem that uh, these mechanisms are equivalent to um, auctions in which people can condition an identity of the counterparty. So just a little bit of, of give, to give a flavor of what kind of algebra it involves to uh, solve this model. So this is not too bad. So what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, take into account the, um, how the player's allocations are changing over time, uh, given trade. So the, uh, the whole vector of allocations changes because of the shocks to the players, to the individual players, and because units are transferred 
according to the matrix Q, given the player's announcements. So players take the slow of motion as given, and then individual players, they decide how, how to report, what to report to the mechanism. So uh, to make sure that each player is optimizing, to ch each player is choosing optimally how much to buy or how much to sell, we have to write a Bellman equation for each player. This Bellman equation consists of the value function of the player and uh, the payoff flow that uh, he is receiving currently and the future expected uh, uh, value function. Uh, and the current payoff flow, a part of it comes from the, this utility of holding the x. So remember that ideally, player wants to hold 0x, but uh, uh, if, if they go positive or they go negative, then they experience this utility. Uh, but the flow of, of utility also has a money component uh, because whenever the player trades, he uh, pays money to buy and he receives money to sell. So this is this, is this part. It's the price times the, times the flow. Uh, it has to be the case that uh, uh, the player has incentives to tell the truth to the mechanism. So uh, this has to be maximized when uh, 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 this is player's own announcement is uh, not distorting his allocation. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, uh, solve this simultaneous system of equations and make sure that the first order condition holds its truth telling. Okay. So of course, because this is a linear quadratic setting, so the uh, payoff flow is quadratic. Uh, because this is a linear quadratic setting, the value functions are going to be quadratic forms. So we can plug it into the Bellman equation. We can take the first order condition uh, the value function of a player uh, is a quadratic form that has um, a matrix, n by n matrix, because there are n players, times a vector times a vector, plus a constant. Okay, uh, And uh, ultimately, this boils down to a system of equations that uh, here's the system, okay, which can be solved uh, either numerically or analytically, or we even have an approximating formula. Uh, for the uh, solution, okay. Uh, there are many equations and many unknowns. Uh, there are n cubed equations here because uh, it's a matrix equation n by n for each of the n players, so n, n cubed. Uh, there are n squared first order conditions because for each of the n players, we have to make sure that the first order condition holds for uh, all of the uh, market conditions for all of the allocations of other players. And this is the market clearing condition that uh, the flows have to add up to zero. Okay, so what is interesting about this system is that uh, if you look at it, um, the shocks, the volatility of the shocks that the players get does not enter anywhere. The only thing that enters as a parameter is the structure of the market characterized by the player's size. Okay, So given the sizes of the player, so for example, we know that this guy is 50% of the market, this guy is 25% of the market, and then maybe there are many small guys, the rest 25% of the market. Given that information, we can determine uh, how any initial allocation is going to be traded and at what price. Okay, So we only need to know the sizes of, of market participants, and given that, uh, we have we can solve for P and Q, which tells us how trade is going to proceed. All right. So this is a little bit abstract. Uh, um, I'm going to give some concrete examples uh, in a second, and I'm going to start with a tractable case that we can solve in closed form. One in which there is a, a single large player and uh, many, many small competitive traders, okay? So this is the most basic example of a uh, heterogeneous market because we have a competitive segment and we have a segment, a uh, single player who actually has market power, okay? Uh, so in that case, uh, the, we do not actually have to uh, write a separate system of a separate set of equations for each of the small traders, 
but we can treat the small trader as one guy, but in that case, we have to uh, mathematically replace the first order condition for the, for the competitive fringe. So in this case, the competitive fringe, instead of uh, taking into account uh, the price impact, which is taken into account in this equation, the fringe is just going to, each individual price, uh, fringe member is just going to be a price taker. They're not going to affect the price individually, but only as a group. Uh, but the large player is going to affect the uh, price uh, individually. All right, so what happens in the market between a large player and the fringe? Uh, so uh, one basic thing that's going to happen is that they are going to trade towards efficiency. Why? Because as long as the allocation is not efficient, there are benefits from trade, so they want to trade. Okay. So this matrix Q is going to uh, generate trading dynamics, which converge eventually to the efficient allocation. And when players converge to the efficient allocation, if there are no more shocks, then uh, the price also converges to the first best price. Okay, and then remember that the first best price, uh, both of the coefficients of vector p are going to be the same, meaning that the first best price depends only on the uh, sum of units rather than the, the specific allocation among the players. Okay, but uh, before players converge to efficient allocations, what do we want to know? We want to know two things. One of the things is how quickly do they trade to efficient allocation? So we want to understand the degree of inefficiency in this market. And two is, does the price deviate from first best price uh, while they trade? Okay, so uh, if players are initially hit by shocks and if there are no more shocks after that, then uh, we know that eventually the price converges to the first best price. But before that, before that, is the price the first best price or is it something else? And if it is something else, then it means that there's going to be price drift, price momentum, okay? So uh, the rate of trade is actually an eigenvalue of this matrix, and this is the rate of trade, okay? So uh, for example, if, uh, so what is, what is this formula? This is the discount rate, like 5% per year, Okay, and this is the, uh, the size of the large uh, market participant. So uh, when the large market participant is smaller, this is in the denominator, then this is going to be a more competitive market uh, and the, trade of, the speed of trade is going to be faster. So for example, suppose a large guy is uh, um, one uh, tenth of a percent of the whole market, you know, maybe a very, very large institutional in investor, right, facing the rest of the market, then we can, we can figure out how fast this guy is going to trade. So not 5% per year, right, but we have to multiply it by 2,000 because there is, a, a, well, actually we have to multiply it by 500, sorry. So it's 5% times uh, uh, five. 500, so uh, he, the, a guy that large might, might want to spread his trade uh, over 10 days. Uh, but uh, you know, if the guy is uh, one ten thousandth of the market, then he might want to spread over a day, but if he is even smaller, then he might trade within hours or within minutes, okay. Um, so the price, this is the first best price, puts equal weight on what player one and player two has the actual price puts different weights and puts a smaller weight on the large player's allocation than the allocation of the fringe. It means that the price is less sensitive to the allocation of the large player, okay? It means that the large player is going to get a more favorable price in equilibrium than the fringe because the price is more sensitive to what the fringe has than what the large player has. So, as an example, consider uh, the large player and the fringe being equal size. And uh, if the large player has one unit to sell, 
and the fringe has one unit to buy, then what's going to happen from those matrices is that uh, trade is going to happen slowly. So these are how the allocations converge to efficiency. But this is going to be the price. And one thing that you see is that the large player is selling initially at a higher price. And then eventually, he sells uh, at, uh, at, the, at the first best price. Okay. But what happens here is something very interesting. Be because of his market power, the large player is able to control the rate of selling and get a better price uh, in the market uh, initially. Okay. So of course, the fringe is rational. It knows, that, uh, uh, it knows that the price is going to have this pattern. It anticipates. But uh, the fringe is uh, you know, so desperate to, uh, to basically try to, to, to trade that it's willing to trade a little bit at, at the high price, even though it knows that the price is going to come down. Okay. So of course, um, how fast the trade proceeds depends on the risk capacity of the fringe. If the fringe gets larger, then, uh, the, risk then the risk capacity is, uh, uh, is uh, larger, and the trade is going to happen slower. Okay, so there is momentum in this market. And uh, the momentum uh, plays in favor of the large players. Okay, so uh, more generally, um, you know, because, uh, because I have limited time, I don't know if I'll have ch a chance to talk, to talk about it in detail. More generally, what happens is at any given moment of time, the momentum in the market is going to depend on the relative uh, market power of buyers and sellers. Okay. So uh, if there is a given price, if I want to know which, price, which way the price is going to move, I want to know who are the buyers, how big they are, who are the sellers, how big they are. And if I, for example, know that the buyers are big and the sellers are small, in that case, I know that the price is going to drift up because it means that the buyers are controlling the price and initially getting a lower price, and eventually the price is going to drift up. So the momentum uh, in this uh, in equilibrium here depends on the relative uh, uh, sizes of buyers and sellers. All right, I'll skip this. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask the question, uh, what happens in this market if I add another player, how that is going to change the dynamics? So suppose I add a player, a uh, second large player, who has allocation zero, meaning that he wants neither to buy nor to sell. Uh, so do you think that, so this new player has allocation zero. Okay. So do you think that because he is sitting at his bliss point that the second large player is not going to trade? Well, you know, maybe it's intuitively no, because he's sitting at his bliss point, but looking at the price, you know, there is high price initially, there is low price later on. You know, we see here that he will want to trade. So he will want to sell short and then buy later and try to uh, make money in this way. So this is how people make money, right? Uh, so effectively what he's going to do is he's going to front run this large seller. Okay, so this is what happens in equilibrium. So uh, he is going to front run. That's the first thing that's going to happen. But then there are uh, two other things that are interesting which are going to happen. Not only is he going to front run, but because he front runs, he takes away market power from the first guy. So the price is going to drop uh, faster. And, the, and the obviously... Uh, uh, the price, so when we put uh, this new guy into the market, the price is going to be more efficient. Uh, one. Two is uh, not only that, but also trade is going to happen faster. Because the first large guy knows that he is getting front run. He does not want to get front run, so how does he avoid? By selling faster, uh, you know, ahead of the front runner. Uh, and uh, this market is rational, so um, the market anticipates that the first guy is going to trade faster. And because of that, the market thinks that uh, underneath the iceberg there is less. So that means that the first large guy is also going to have a lower price impact in this market. 
Okay? So the front runner uh, can actually be beneficial, and whether they are beneficial, we can look at it later. The front runner can actually be beneficial because uh, he makes the market more liquid. Okay? The market anticipates that the first guy is trading faster and therefore allows the first guy to trade with less market impact because the market knows that the first guy is hiding less. All right. So uh, we can uh, analyze this model also with asymmetric traders, but in this case, we have, to, we have an approximating formula. Okay. So I'm going to skip this. I'm going to talk about uh, welfare a little bit, and then I'm going to uh, probably uh, conclude. Okay. So in terms of welfare, um, one of the interesting things that comes out is that uh, generally, when we add uh, new traders in the market that can front run, uh, uh, well, what, is the, what, is, what intuition do people have? People have the intuition that uh, uh, you know, the front runners, they definitely help uh, uh, small investors. But people have the intuition that the front runners, they're bad for uh, large institutional traders because uh, they uh, take away, maybe take away from their market power. Okay, so let's see what actually happens. So there's also the opposite intuition that uh, um, the front runners make the market more liquid. So we can do an actual experiment and we can look at what happens in the market when uh, there is a large trader in the fringe, and we can add a, a front runner. And this, uh, these are the utilities, given these shocks, uh, if there is no front runner. Okay, so the fringe gets a higher utility because the fringe has a bigger risk capacity here. Okay, remember, the risk capacity is the inverse of B. Uh, if you add the front runner, then uh, here, uh, both the large player and the fringe get better off, and then the front runner gets positive profit. Why is this the case? Because the front runner speeds up the trade in the market and reduces inefficiency. Okay, and this actually benefits uh, the large guy. Okay, are front runners good for everybody? Well, uh, they're bad for other front runners. Okay, so if in this example the first large guy gets no shock, so he's a liquidity provider. He gets positive utility because he provides the liquidity to the fringe. Uh, and when we end the second large guy who also provides liquidity, then he competes with the first large guy, and so the utility uh, goes down. Okay. So uh, anonymous trading, I have uh, no time to talk about it, but uh, uh, here with identified trading, markets are uh, inefficient because the price is not first best. It takes a while to converge to first best. Uh, but markets are informationally efficient because people have, you know, uh, people uh, have information that everybody else has because everybody signals their information by their flow. Okay. Uh, with anonymous trading, markets are neither efficient nor informationally efficient. Okay. But of course, you know, if this was a model with uh, investment, then uh, uh, it's not informational efficiency that matters, but it's efficiency, right? Because what matters is at what price you can uh, trade currently. So if you cannot uh, basically uh, trade frictionlessly, then you're also not going to uh, invest optimally because, uh, because of the informational inefficiency. Okay. Uh, and uh, relationship banking is, this is just one mechanism but uh, there are also other mechanisms one can think about. So for example, uh, there is room here for brokers that have a relationship with clients and they can actually significantly improve on the outcome, on the market outcome by providing uh, a flatter uh, demand function to their clients. So here, clients, here uh, traders are afraid to trade because they have market impact, but the brokers, they can help by giving them a, a flatter uh, uh, supply-demand function by subsidizing large trades, and then they can uh, try to make money off of small trades. And actually, it's, it's possible to get a much better outcome uh, in this case. But this requires uh, uh, relationships. This requires uh, some type of a, uh, a commitment uh, between the parties. Okay. 
So let me conclude because I think that this is time. Okay, this is this is so. Uh, one part of this paper is a methodological contribution because I, th I think because uh, we want to uh, have a way of analyzing these markets with heterogeneous participants and think about uh, 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 market efficiency uh, and, and those things in this context where instead of having fully competitive markets, we have markets where there are separate finitely many traders that have market power. Okay. And uh, we get a lot of interesting things by assuming that markets are not anonymous. And then we are working on uh, 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 what, what's going to happen with anonymous markets. So there are many interesting th things that come out. So uh, players, they trade slowly to reduce price impact. This is inefficiency. Market wants to know the source of flow and it reacts differently to retail and institutional flow. Um, uh, traders front run flow from large players. Uh, there's front running in equilibrium. And front running happens naturally from very neutral assumptions. It's not like you know, we've engineered uh, a model to have this front running. Uh, there is momentum in the market. The price has momentum. The price is not uh, efficient, and it depends on the different market power of buyers versus sellers. Okay, whoever has more market power is going to uh, get a more favorable price. Market power is not necessarily a benefit, because if anybody has market power, people anticipate that they have market power, that they are hiding more in the background, and so uh, the market punishes players uh, with the market power. So one thing that's going to happen is that because the market punishes players with the market power, if we, if we have a market with uh, a misallocation, then generally trade among uh, small market participants is going to happen much, much faster. They're going to converge to an efficient allocation among themselves much faster than uh, between the small segment of the market and the large players. And among the large players, it's going to be even slower than between the large and the small. Okay, so market power uh, also bites you back uh, unless you hide behind small players. It bites you back because players anticipate that you're hiding. Uh, and then the relationship banking can improve efficiency. This is just one mechanism, but there are other mechanisms that, uh, that can actually uh, achieve better outcomes. Thank you. So I'm just going to make a, a few comments. Basically, let me do two slides on maybe the big picture or a little overview. Uh, so what I think are the main contributions of the paper, it's a, a little bit related maybe to that uh, the last concluding slide. Uh, I think the first thing is that this paper delivers a tractable model uh, which allows to study interesting dynamic phenomena that requires asymmetry or heterogeneity in the participants. And I think that is the key substantive contribution. And it, in particular, it makes clear how equilibrium market power depends on size and, and exposure, exposure to endowment shocks, and, and how that relates to the speed of trade. And I think that that is a very neat, uh, a, the, there are very neat conclusions that one can draw from the paper. Uh, third, it allows welfare analysis of interesting phenomena such as merger or splits, uh, and in that sense, I think it's a, it, it can be applied very well. And, and the methodological contribution is this use of uh, conditional double auctions and this assumption, this simplifying assumption that one can, could condition on on the flows. Okay. A little bit more about the technical content of the paper, maybe this reflects my own biases. Uh, so what the paper provides is a characterization for the linear quadratic equilibrium. And then there are some closed forms, which are interesting because they relate to the interesting cases, like, the, uh, like the, this case of uh, one big, the asymmetries, one big player and a fringe. Uh, so there is, for the linear quadratic case, there is a closed form for the fringe against the one big player. 
And then there is a sort of approximation result to try to understand what, uh, sorry, say, let me go back again. There is this benchmark case of a symmetric players, which is kind of known in the literature, and then there is an approximation around the symmetric case to see how the heterogeneity would play a role. Uh, and then there is a closed form for one large player uh, plus a fringe, which allow us to understand uh, this uh, price momentum, which is uh, one of the main uh, dynamic phenomena that uh, this paper is about. Okay. Now it's turned off. And finally, there is a characterization for exponential utility. So one so thing, one I, will, thing I, think I think I would like to see, see, and I think it may be possible, I, I didn't really do the, the numbers, but I think one may be able to get a close form for two large players that are sort of symmetric in the risk capacity, but they may have different sigmas. So to play a little bit around about this idea of when you become a front runner in, the, in this model. Because it also has to do with, it, it's identified a little bit with the idea that they are not really exposed to endowment shocks and they just trade because, in order to make money. Not because they really want to change their positions. And then let me make uh, four simple comments about the paper. So, one thing is about trade frequency. And I think this is sort of a substantive thing related to the literature. There is, in this model, we, they are basically assuming that the trade frequency from start is infinity, in the sense that you could trade arbitrarily frequent. And in the literature, there is a, a, a big part of the debate is about how much, uh, how, how good is to modify the, the speed of the market, in the sense that the feasibility of trading faster. So the discussion, in a sense, is depending on exactly what are the, the underlying factors, uh, it may be that the optimal speed is not, the, efficient, the socially efficient speed is not infinity. And this is because, in reality, there is a sort of a trade-off. On one side, it's true that faster markets allow to converge to efficient allocations faster, and that's uh, improve efficiency. But on the other hand, uh, frequency restrictions may allow some sort of commitment on the trades, and in particularly, it will limit these strategic effects on the behavior of large players, which are clearly going against efficiency in this setting. So in a sense, it would, uh, it would uh, dampen a little bit this uh, tip of the iceberg effect that Yuli was talking about. So then the other comment is about from running. Uh, it's true that from running can be what this model is, is describing, but at least I, but the, uh, I think many people think about from running as sort of related to exploiting private information. And in sense, it's typically associated with an illegal activity of from running because you, you have privileged information about trades that are going to happen. And in this model, this is a completely legal sort of from running that comes just from anticipating strategically uh, the behavior of, of large players optimal behavior of large players. And I think that distinction, even when, when it's true that this is from running, uh, should be at least uh, noted. And this is in particular because the drift on prices here is public, right? It's all based on public information and the strategies of the players. And in this sense, front runners just make money out of liquidity. They are arbitrageurs in, uh, in this, and they are not making money out of private information. Then uh, I don't really see what the exponential case is adding to this paper in the sense that it doesn't get much dynamic action. And it's true that it, it sort of nests the linear quadratic model in terms of the policy space because the policies are, can be so, uh, seen, the policies in the, in the exponential case when for particular values of sigma are, are the linear quadratic ones. But I'm not sure how uh, if really one can nest the models in terms of welfare, for instance. So you could have like two sequences of models in the linear quadratic case and the exponential. I'm not sure that you would rank it in the same way uh, as sigma goes to zero. Um, finally, there are a couple of multiplicity issues that I think may, maybe they, they should be addressed. Uh, one has to do with, it's not clear to me whether the characterization 
of the linear quadratic model is fully necessary, at least as it is stated in the version of the paper that I saw. Uh, and then also, I would like to know a little bit about how much multiplicity the, the characterization allows, uh, and if there are some invariants in the equilibrium that one could identify. Uh, and finally, there is another proposition in the case in which you allow uh, private information about fundamentals, and then it's not clear whether uniqueness holds for that proposition too. Uh, um, and finally, one comment about the multiplicity, because in the paper, attention is restricted to non-degenerate equilibria. Um, I think it would be interesting to try to understand uh, whether there, are, there would be incentives for big players, especially players that hold a lot of market power to select uh, or maybe coordinate in some of the degenerate equilibrium, which some other players are out of the market. So basically, those are my comments. So thanks again. Thanks, Vinicius. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Well, there should be a microphone around, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, l let me. Uh, so about subsidies. Uh, this is related to uh, the last part on uh, relationship banking a little bit because brokers they can facilitate uh, b uh, trades by providing uh, less uh, steep supply demand function to their clients, uh, and uh, this can improve efficiency. And uh, uh, if done properly in, in this setting, yes, the, this can uh, achieve the efficient allocation. So, uh, so in that case, yes, this is possible. Okay. And, and sort of the, the second part was how complicated would these subsidies be to fully achieve efficiency back? So, so one of the things that's required in those mechanisms is that it, it's required uh, participation by other players. So in the efficient mechanism, what the broker does is it uh, uh, takes the unit from a client that wants to sell, and then it forces the other clients to, uh, to accept the units according to their risk capacities. So the other clients, they have to agree to participate that if they get allocated, the units allocated, that they will take them. Uh, you know, the, the broker then compensates them, but, but not enough. And the, the reason they are willing to do that is because in the future, then they get, uh, when, when they get shocks in the future, then they're able to, to trade as well and to benefit from this mechanism. Thank you so much, Yuli. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Leandro. So, so I also want to thank Leander for the, for the excellent comments. And uh, um, I wrote down some notes, and we can uh, talk about them during the break. Thank, thank you very you so much. much.